Welcome to the Coalition for Civil Freedom's 10th webinar in a series of webinars designed to educate about CCF's core mission. Our mission is to defend civil freedoms, promote a fair criminal justice system, and advocate for political prisoners in the war on terror. My name is Steve Downs. I will be the moderator for today. I am a lawyer and a former executive director of CCF, and I am presently the chair of CCF's board of directors. Today's topic is the Fort Dix Five case in which five Muslim Americans were entrapped and given life sentences for conspiracy. Although the defendants never made a specific plan to do anything illegal, and the government supplied most of the alleged criminal activity. By way of disclosure, I am one of the authors of CCF's uh, report uh, on political prisoners entitled uh, Inventing Terrorists, which includes an article uh, on the Fort Dix Five case as one of the five worst cases of injustice in the war on terror. Also, I recently uh, began representing uh, one of the Fort Dix Five defendants, uh, Drayton Duca, on a post-conviction motion. With us today are uh, Huma Yassin, a legal aid lawyer from Texas who is writing a book about the Fort Dix Five case. And we also have Lamine Sh uh, Schnoor, who is the sister of the defendant, Mohammed Schnoor, to talk about the impact of the case on her family. So I, we're gonna start with you, Huma. We're very fortunate to have someone here who's actually in the process of writing a book about uh, the case, and I congratulate you on what you are doing. Could you just describe uh, a little bit about what this case is about for the, the lay people who haven't had a chance to get into the weeds on it? Yeah, I'd love to. First of all, thank you so much for having me today to talk about this case. It's a, it's a really important case, and I think, um, just by way of introduction, the best way to kind of go about this case is to talk, uh, the way I've structured this talk is to do it by talking about three things. First, I want to talk about why the government is manufacturing cases um, like this. Second, I want to talk about how they're manufacturing cases. And then third, I, I really want to spend the vast majority of my time speaking about the Fort Dix Five, particularly. It is a very um, complex case because there are five parties involved and it was a 16 month long sting with multiple informants. So um, there's definitely a lot to cover and I'm gonna try my best to get us through all the material in a timely fashion. So the first is, the first big question is the why. Why is the government uh, manufacturing cases against people that have no basis in actual crime? And what we know about the um, FBI and the history of the FBI is that actually it's always sort of regulated dissident speech. It's always been surveilling people that it doesn't like, whether um, they were from the civil rights movement or they were kind of labeled as communists at the, you know, um, during the Cold War. Um, there's COINTEL. Pro. So this playbook that exists about regulating dissident speech is not um, unique to this, you know, the Muslim environment. It's, it's a playbook that's been used and is continuing to be used um, in the Black Lives Matter movement and um, in the uh, climate, climate change movement. All kinds of movements are very he heavily regulated. Um, another thing is that um, post 9-11, there was a huge shift with the FBI policy from um, going in and actually disrupting sleeper cells that existed to identifying people that at some point might do something bad and then introducing um, informants to kind of uh, manipulate them into doing something so that they could later prosecute. So um, anybody who's familiar with um, the, the film Minority Report, um, where basically it's prosecuting crime that hasn't happened, and, and many times it's just thought crime, it wouldn't have happened anyway. Um, and the last thing, which is maybe even the most important, I don't know if there's a really a most important in this situation, but every year the FBI has to go in front of Congress and beg for more money or ask for more money in their budget. And doesn't it look real good to take a whole lot of cases that you just made up and then say that, look at me, I foiled these cases. I need more money, I need a bigger budget. There's more cases out there like this and we need to protect America and keep it safe. So, so that, that kind of gives you the context to why there's so much surveillance and, um, and why the government kind of has its hands in, in all of this speech. So 
Secondly, we need to talk about how a case is manufactured. There's no case that exists. There's no criminal underlying criminal conduct that actually exists. So how are they manufacturing it? Well, the FBI, through its own admission, has an army of over 15,000 informants all over the United States. And these informants aren't, you know, walking around with a sign that says I'm an informant. They're undercover. They're um, talking to the, they're talking to their handlers. Um, they're, they're grooming people online. They're in masjids. Um, and in the vast majority of terrorism-based prosecutions, um, none of the defendants in these cases were anywhere close to actually committing a, um, a criminal act. Like they didn't have the means. A lot of times they didn't even have the motive. They didn't even understand what they were being accused of in some cases. And again, in the vast majority of them, the criminal element is supplied by this FBI informant who has kind of a perverse incentive to generate information. So now we're gonna, so that's kind of an overview. And now we're gonna kind of switch our lens and talk about the Fort Dix Five case uh, specifically. Now, um, in this case, uh, they were charged with criminal conspiracy. So it's really important for folks to understand what criminal conspiracy means. And in, in criminal law, um, we have something called elements, which is kind of like ingredients in um, like a really complex, like a really complex, like baking, you know, uh, like a cake or something. Like you can't, you have to have every single one of these ingredients in order to get a successful conviction. I mean, ideally, although it didn't happen in this case, but theoretically. So um, a criminal conspiracy requires a willful and intentional agreement between two or more people. And um, those people cannot include the government informant. So a willful and intentional agreement between two or more people to commit a criminal act and an overt act in furtherance of that conspiracy. So um, again, like you, at least two or more people, they have to, it has to be an agreement. It's intentional. It's willful. You have to know what you're doing. Um, and it has to be an agreement to break the law. And then you have to take steps to achieve that um, breaking of the law. So in this case, um, there are five individuals that were prosecuted and convicted. Um, Hamach Noor, Lemis is his sister, Sardar Tatar, and um, Dritan, Shaheen, and El Javir Duka, who are three brothers. And um, just to give you kind of a, a broad frame of reference, all of these guys were friends. They went to high school together. Mohammed Schnur um, was related to El Javir Duka, um, who also goes by Suleiman Duka, um, because Mohammed Schnur's sister was at that time, El Javier Duca's wife. So there was also a family relationship there. This is a group of people that know each other. And before we really get into the weeds, um, I want to tell you guys that I have personally reviewed in preparation and in writing this um, book, um, a six week trial transcript, which was close to 7,000 pages, hundreds upon hundreds of informant based, um, I'll hang on one second hundreds and hundreds upon, uh, of hours of informant-based wire recordings, over 300 FBI 302s, um, over 10,000 FISA wire taps, which are phone calls that the uh, government tapped, hundreds of and hundreds of surveillance logs, which are basically the FBI following these people and tracking them. And in this case, there was not one piece of direct evidence that an agreement between these five men existed to engage in any criminal activity, much less an act of terror. And if there was a smoking gun, you'd better believe that the prosecution would have led with that. And they didn't because they didn't have it. And um, I also just want to note for you guys uh, who may not be familiar with criminal law, um, the government is the one that compiles all of the evidence. And then the government also is the one that decides what part of that evidence that they're going to hand over to the defendants, the defendants can use in their, in their defense of the prosecution. So I am 100% sure that the government has far more information that they disclosed, but it's just that this is what we got and ultimately the government's the gatekeeper. 
So now um, we're going to get into the specifics. And again, this is a really complex case. So I tried to do this. Um, the easiest way that I thought to do this was to divide the case into three parties to show you how they sort of manufactured the appearance of a conspiracy. And the official government position is that the, the sting began after a DVD was turned over to the Joint Terrorism Task Force of about, basically it's a DVD of a bunch of Muslim guys um, on vacation in the Poconos and they're out at a gun range. They have big beards and, cam and they're wearing camo and they're shooting, doing target shooting. And also on that video was them doing things like horseback riding and skiing and going, uh, you know, on a boat. But, um, you know, none of that was, none of that was really what they were concerned with. And also it should be noted that this DVD was turned over to Circuit City by one of the Duca brothers because they wanted to make copies for everybody that went on the trip to hand them out kind of like as a memento of the trip. So um, I'm going to tell you off the bat that I don't believe that the official position is the correct, you know, is, is accurate. And the reason I don't believe that is because the key informant in this case, whose name is Mahmoud Omar, um, he was actually relocated from, um, I, I believe it was Paul's borough to Cherry Hill by the government several months in at September of 2005 several months before the um, investigation actually started, which was January of 2006. Um, the government paid for the relocation, and from that time, uh, Mahmoud Omar began befriending Mohammed Schnur, who was really the key target in this case. Um, now, a little bit about Mahmoud Omar. This guy is the gold standard of informants. There are good informants and there are bad informants. Um, but Mahmoud Omar, he was, I mean, unfortunately, the best. And the reason he was the best is because he was a serial con artist before he even walked into the door with the FBI. That's, that was his profession, was to con people. And he was actually caught up in a bank fraud scheme, his second bank fraud scheme, after he'd done a, lot of, a whole lot of other stuff. And he was given um, the option to either comply with the government as an informant or face prosecution. And, um, you know, nobody wants to go into the... Uh, penitentiary, federal penitentiary. So he decided to um, to cooperate. Now, what does it mean to be a good con artist? It means that you can spend about 10 minutes with a person and you can identify um, all of their soft spots. You know what their Achilles heel is. You can figure out what their psychological weaknesses are, what they want, you know, what they, what they desire, what their goals are. And you get to use that as a weapon to your own advantage and get exactly what it is that you're looking for. That's what, that's what good con artists do. Unfortunately, it's, I mean, it's a terrible thing. So Omar moves to Cherry Hill um, and he starts going to Muhammad's family's halal meat market called the Plaza Food Market. And you know, Muhammad is working there. Um, he, he starts perusing through, Omar starts perusing through the aisles, talking to Muhammad a lot. And he learns very quickly that Muhammad's a really sweet kid. But he's also kind of naive and in a place in his life where he feels a little bit defeated. I mean, he kind of feels like a failure. He's um, not currently enrolled in, in community college or university. He's not a huge fan of working at the halal food market. And he was kind of not moving up financially either. And um, he's not, he doesn't have any like real prospects of finding a significant other. And all the while he's seeing his friends um, who are entering into their 20s moving forward in their lives. And he's just, I mean, life is not always easy. And there are a lot of times where I'm sure, I mean, I can identify with this where there's uh, times of great happiness and there are times where you kind of feel like you're stuck in a rut. Well, this was a time where he was definitely stuck in a rut and he was looking for a way to, you know, kind of move his life into a different direction. 
So what does Omar do? Omar starts lavishing Muhammad with attention, asking him all kinds of questions about Islam and spinning together this story about him being a reform Muslim. Um, he tells him that he's, uh, he used to be a gambler and an alcoholic, which is true and it continued to be true during this time as well. But he says that he's left all of that because you know he wants to be religious, he wants to be a reformed Muslim, and he doesn't know where to start because all of his friends, um, you know, have abandoned him because he wants to be religious now, and he doesn't have any family here. He's from Egypt, so Muhammad, being like a really sweet and generous person, kind of adopts him as a brother. Um, even though Omar is like a decade and a half older than him, he takes on this role as an advisor with him and begins to teach him, okay, well, this is what you need to do to get your life in order. You know, don't drink, don't cheat on your wife, you know, um, legitimize your, uh, relationship with the, the woman you're living with, you know, goes through and gives him, um, a ton of religious material as well, CDs. Um, DVDs, uh, different recordings of lectures so that he can inform himself on, uh, you know, how to, how to come back to Islam. And another thing that they do a lot is talk about politics and lament about the situation, which at that time in 2006 in, in the Middle East, that is at the height of the insurgency. Um, there's a revelation of the Abu Ghraib torture. Those pictures had just come out. There's a lot of the intelligence um, showing that the Iraq war was fabricated had already come out. And um, a big point of contention also is Muhammad as an as a ethnic Palestinian, um, you know, was very up to date about uh, the United States' involvement in Israel and sort of um, kind of approval of Israel's tacit approval of Israel's continued annexation and human rights uh, violations in, in Palestine. So, um, so they're having these conversations, they're talking about politics, they're talking about religion. Muhammad is just sitting behind a cash register like a sitting duck. Like there, there ain't nowhere he can go because this is, this is his place of business and, um, and Omar is coming at all, at all hours, you know, over there. Um, and then at the same time, Muhammad and his family start having a lot of different mechanical issues with their, with their vehicles. And Omar, wouldn't you know it, is a car mechanic. Um, so he now begins to start fixing the cars for free. He's, he's over there um, providing all kinds of mechanical help uh, to those vehicles for free. And he says that, he's no long, that he no longer works as a car mechanic. He um, brandishes himself as a uh, import-export car dealer um, internationally, but um, like he's, he's exporting internationally. But, um, but he's like, but I'm going to do this favor to you, Muhammad, because you're so important to me and I care about you so much and you're like a little brother to me. So um, also at this time, uh, Omar begins to order a lot of food um, catered by Fatin Schnur, Lamis and Muhammad's mom. I've had her food. I understand why he ordered so much. She's a wonderful cook. Their food is delicious. But anyway, um, again, he's ingratiating himself more into the family and becoming kind of this indisposable person. So as a result, Muhammad also introduces Omar to the Duca brothers and all of his family and friends. And Omar, in the meantime, doesn't waste any time um, forming a relationship with the Dukas. And again, he's representing himself as a successful businessman that is willing to teach the Dukas how to flip flip cars. So he takes the Dukas to an auto auction, purchases several cars for them, three, three or four cars for them, and promises to help them um, with all of the repair work so that they can flip them at a profit and start um, including that in their kind of annual revenue. So moving back to Muhammad, at some point, Omar starts to ask Muhammad for videos uh, online. And, um, and Muhammad at this point is pretty, pretty far indebted into this relationship. So anything Omar is going to ask him, he's going to try to give it. So um, he starts searching up videos and downloading them to his computer and, and, and presenting them to Omar. 
And the, the problem for Omar is that just downloading videos about a war, even if they have graphic content, isn't a crime. So what he does is he uses the videos as a launch pad to, to, to try to get Muhammad to be more radicalized in his speech. So for, by way of example, um, he'll, let, let's say they're watching something about, something in Palestine about um, you know, a family getting their home bulldozed. So Omar will start saying, we've been talking about this since 1947 and I'm so sick of talking about this. All we do as Arabs is talk and talk and talk. When are we gonna do something? What are we gonna do? Tell me when we're gonna do something. And, um, and you know, Muhammad's like, yeah, you know, it's sad. We do talk, that's all we do. It's, you know, we talk and we pray because really that's all we can do. And um, there's, there's nothing really else. So each time uh, Muhammad, uh, Omar is kind of bullying him into saying something like, he, he, Muhammad will kind of step back and he'll say, yeah, you're right. You know, it's awful. I and and he can understand the anger too, right? The frustration, but that's all the that's all we can do. He's remarkably consistent about not getting hooked on the what are we going to do cross examination by Omar. Except for one night. One night, um, Omar comes over and he's been coming over this time in July, like every single day for several days. And it's really, really hot. And he's underneath one of their minivans fixing a gas gasket. And um, Muhammad uh, invites him into the house after he's done, nobody's there. And they start looking at a video. And, and again, Omar is like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And, and this happens over the course of time and it's consistent and he does it a lot. Um, but uh, anyway, so Muhammad after, afterwards, he's like, well, after being pushed and pushed and pushed, he says, oh, well, if you really want to do something, um, there's Fort Dix. We can do something in Fort Dix. So he kind of says it off the cuff and he clearly has no, um, you know, no intention to do it. But the second that Omar gets that Fort Dix on, uh, Fort Dix on the record, on the recorder, that's when things, that's when he starts to really push things into overdrive. Um, and by that, I mean that Omar starts harassing Muhammad to come, come drive with him. And Omar actually drives uh, with Schneur, so with Muhammad sitting in the passenger seat, side, um, drives him to Fort Dix and McGuire Air Force Base. And, and there's a CCTV that's recording everything they're saying and they're doing. And it's kind of like a comedy of errors. You know, I mean, there it's like dumb and dumber. Nobody knows where anybody's going. The entire surveillance lasts more, less than two minutes. And it's clear that nobody has any real, real plans to do anything. We may have to wrap this up in a few minutes. So I <laughs> I feel like I just got into the Muhammad part. Well, so, I understand. What, what we could do is just go to Lamise for a little bit, get her kind, and then, yeah. then come back to you if you like. All yeah, right. I think that's a good idea. All right. Um, Lamise, um, you, you sort of heard the description here. Do you, do you want to add anything at this point to what, what's been said? Um, at the time uh, Mahmoud Omar came into our lives. Yes, talk, talk a little bit about that. How, how much did you know him? Were you involved in it with him at all? Um, honestly, no, not Mahmoud Omar, no. Um, there was the uh, Joseph. Joseph um, yep. was he was more involved in our life, acting like um, he was uh, like he used to come in and fix our house as a construction worker. This would be are we talking about Bengali here? No, no. Um, it was about us the secret informant. That was never mentioned oh. uh, was Joseph, uh, whom I think is aware of him. Yes, I am. And again, because this, this case is really complex, I did, that was one of the things, I mean, I've only gone through a third of the case so far, so that's one of the things that yeah, I did. I, I had never even heard of this, so this is brand oh, yeah. new to me. Go ahead. Um, I honestly saw Joseph more than Mahmoud Omar. Um, he wasn't, he, I mean, not that what I, I would know. He never came to our house while I was there. So I only used to see him in the store. But for Joseph, he was literally over our house because um, 
he was remodeling our bathrooms, our basement, and so on. So he was more um, in our house. Um, he, was, he came as a converter, as a former um, veteran. So um, he came in and basically made him his way in the family. And um, honestly, I'm sorry. Um, I know this must be very difficult for you. It is. Uh, it, br it brings back so much memories. Um, I was 11 at the time before my brother got arrested. And it's, it's hard, you know, when you have someone in your house and you treat them as your own. And then you don't know what they're doing. You don't really know um, what they're planning against their family. Um, so he would always, honestly, he would always come to us, like us, um, my, myself and my sister that was 14 and I was 11, he would tell us, um, oh, you, got, you guys are like so bonded as a family and it's so nice and I like to be part of it in that way that like he would speak out of envy, you know what I mean? Because we were um, a family that really stuck together and family meant everything to us. So he would go on and on and on about saying, you guys, I want to be part of this family. And as, um, you know, a former Christian, we never had that. And it's so nice to see the Muslim community, how you guys are. So um, us being like really naive, we're like, yeah, well, you're part of our family too, you know, basically you're always over and fixing stuff for us. And um, he started um, this business with my brother, the contracting business. And um, they bought a uh, van on my brother's name. And basically they were working together. Like my brother was working with him on the side. Um, my brother was working also in Plaza Food Market. And he was also working as a taxi driver during the night. So he was basically in our lives, in the house remodeling and at the same time working with my brother. Um, as for Mahmoud Omar, as I said, I really didn't see him that much as often as Joseph. All right. And you were 11 years old when he, your brother was arrested? Uh, I just turned 12. But 11 was, the, I was 11 during the surveillance time when Joseph came in our live and Mahmoud Omar as well. Yeah. And what do you remember of that, of that arrest? Do you remember the arrest? I do. Um, I remember we were coming back home. It was my mom and my older sister, my younger sister. And when we got to the street to our house, there was FBI that um, stopped the car. And they said, you guys have to stop and get out. We need to search the vehicle. And we saw, saw all these um, police cars, the squad, the FBI, I'm like, what's going on? And they said, your, they told my mother, your, your son Muhammad has been, um, it, um, has been involved in suspicious activities. So at that time, we didn't know my brother got arrested. I mean, I didn't know. Right away, my, my um, you know, my catch told me to call my brother. And when I called him, it went straight to voicemail. Um, they said, you guys should go get a hotel room. You know, this is going to take long. This is going to probably be overnight search. So you guys are going to need, you guys are not allowed in the house. So, they were going to uh, search your house at that point. Yeah, they were searching our house when we weren't there. They went in and... That time, we never used to lock our doors, honestly, because, you know, our door was always open. We just, like, closed it, but not locked it. So they, like, literally went in and were, were searching the house. And we had to go to our aunt's house because they were there. And my mom didn't want us around the FBI. She didn't want to, you know, scare us. But the second day, the news reporters, um, there was helicopters around the courtroom. They were following us. And we realized that, this is bigger than we thought it would be. I mean, at first we thought it was something small. They're going to be out tomorrow. Misunderstand that. We didn't know that there was anything tied with the terrorist case. We didn't know about all Mahmoud Omar or Joseph or anything. We just thought it was like a small misunderstanding and he's going to come home with us from court. So we go to court and they, they talk about the stuff that he's facing. And we're looking in shock. Like, when did this all happen? And... When they searched our home, they didn't find not a single weapon. So how is this guy going to go attack a base when he doesn't own a single weapon? It's like, you know, it doesn't make sense. And then, like, 
further on, um, we started knowing that Mahmoud Omar was an informant and so on. And that whole experience was really, really, really like hard. Um, it's painful to remember because yeah. like my brother was just turned 22 at that time. Um, they arrested him May 7th and my yeah. brother turned 22 April 28th. So you're talking about like a year and a half ago, they started the surveillance. My brother was only 21, 2021. 20, so I can only imagine what a boy um, during that age is going through, especially my brother, because his weakness was always being the only boy in our family. And he, you know, he really um, always wanted a brother. He, he wanted someone with him and Mahmoud coming in and noticing that weakness, he made sure he took advantage of that part of my brother. Yeah. Uma, can you uh, continue just sort of how we, how we get to the arrest? Yeah, I, I, I want to just say one thing um, in response to what Lamise said, which I think is such a fantastic point that you brought up. Um, Joseph Stefano, and we talked about this before, that the government gets to decide what it's going to give in terms of evidence um, to the defense team. And the, the government to date has never disclosed Joseph De Stefano as an informant. However, I share uh, the belief, as Lamise does, that Joseph De Stefano had pre-groomed um, you know, Muhammad for Omar before he came in, before Omar came in. So that's, that's a really good point is that experientially she was living it, but in the, in the, the record that we have that was given to the defense team, that we don't have recordings of Joseph DiStefano because he never took the stand. He never testified and said anything. Um, so that's another, another big problem that, um, that the defense has to, has to deal with in, in cases like this. Um, so I, yeah, I can, I can go on if you're well, We if have you're, to, cause we have to get to the end of the crime right? <laughs> <laughs> or the non-crime. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, I'm going to try to speed up. So anyway, at this point, so we're, what we have is that, um, Omar has, has taken, taken, um, Muhammad to Fort Dix and, uh, McGuire Air Force Base. But all we have is that, right? Is just Muhammad and and Omar. There's no there's no agreement between two people. We're still missing several key elements for conspiracy. So now Omar is going to shift gears and start focusing on telling Muhammad, "Look, me and you were not enough. Who who else is going to be with us, Muhammad? I thought you had friends. I thought you had people. I thought you knew people. Blah blah blah. Like he's going to keep uh, keep trying to groom him in that way. So Muhammad again, like he. He's, uh, there's a, a little bit of an abuse of power here. He's dealing with a person who he wants to stay close to, who's a decade and a half older than him. So he just starts spitting out names of people that he knows. And among those names are, you know, his relatives, the Duca brothers, um, and then Sirdar Tatar, because Sirdar's father owns a pizzeria that delivers onto the Fort Dix, uh, Fort Dix base. So he throws those, uh, those names out. Down that Omar has names, he has a little bit of a lead, but names aren't enough. So he has to try to generate some kind of a meeting between these people and, and have them talk about this plan together. And, and so he continues to push Muhammad. And Muhammad, the poor thing, he's constantly contradicting himself. He's like, yeah, I talked to them. Well, no, I didn't really talk to them. Yeah, they know what's going on. I gave him a hint. I'm, you know, they're busy. I'm busy. We're working. Our schedules aren't really aligning. So he's constantly like, you know, in this back and forth with Omar trying to please him like as a, you know, he's a pleaser. So he wants to please the informant. But at the same time, like he doesn't want to get caught up into this web of lies, even though he kind of is caught up into this web of lies. So that's kind of the, the main Muhammad story. Now we're going to move to, um, so Muhammad, in, for purposes of this conspiracy, he's the talker, but he's not the doer. So moving to Sirdar Tatar. And remember that I told you that a good con artist is, a good con artist is going to sniff out that person's need and points of vulnerability. Well, Sardar Tatar has recently been married. He eloped and he is in a severe financial crisis at the time that he meets uh, Mahmoud Omar. 
Sardar meets him outside the mosque um, with, he's with the Duca brothers and he's with, uh, with um, Muhammad and they tell him, you know, hey, this is our friend Omar. He's a pre previously uh, was a car mechanic and he does import export. And Sardar's like, oh my God, you're a godsend. I'm going through all of these issues with my car. Can you help me? So Omar, of course, is like, of course I can help you. And another thing that's interesting is all of these people seem to have more car problems than anybody I've ever met in my entire life. And I have a lot of questions about that too. But um, not to digress. So, so Omar starts fixing um, Sardar's car, but then Sardar is like, look, this car isn't fixable. I need to buy a car, but I can't afford to buy a car. So oh, he, he works at 7-Eleven at the time and he's like, I hate my job. I want to get into this import export business like you do. I want to learn from you. So Omar's like, yeah, of course, come with me. I'll help you. I'll, I'll fund you. You need a new car. I'll buy you a new car. You don't have to pay me anything. I'll fix it for you and I'll give it to you. And we can structure it in like a pay as you go, whenever interest free loan, whatever you have, you can give me. I mean, this dude is dealing out like some real sweet deals. So, um, so he does that. So, uh, uh, Sardar starts going to the auto auction with Omar. Um, and during these car rides, Omar starts hinting at, at planning something or doing something. And Sardar, it's very obvious from the recordings, has no idea what he's talking about. But when he kind of starts to understand that Omar is referring to something nefarious on, Fort, uh, on the Fort Dix base, Sardar is immediately like, you can't do that. This isn't right. There's other ways to go about things. And he's trying to talk Omar out of it. Uh, he's actively trying to talk Omar out of it. And here is the real kicker. When he realizes that he's not going to talk Omar out of it, he does something really extraordinary. And like I told y'all, he worked at 7-Eleven. Um, and it just happens to be that at 7-Eleven, like clockwork, there's a police officer that goes and gets his coffee every single day. And Sardar is actually really good friends with this police officer because Previously, Sardar um, actually wanted to be in the police force and he'd taken um, tests to get in, but unfortunately wasn't able to clear those tests. So this guy, Sean Dandridge, comes to work, I mean, comes to Sardar's work, 7-Eleven, and Sardar tells him, he's like white as a sheet, and he's like, I need to talk to you in the back office. There's something very, very serious. And so Sean Dandridge, the police officer, goes into the back office and Mahmoud said, Oh, I mean, and uh, Sardar says, look, I know this guy. His name is Mahmoud Omar. He describes him completely. And he says, I think he's about to commit a terrorist act. And we need to get the FBI in. I don't know what it is. I don't know how big it's going to be. But I am 100% sure that this guy is planning something. So they go back and forth about who's going to call the FBI. And they decide since Sean Dandridge is in law enforcement, it makes most sense for him to call. So Sean Dandridge, on a piece of paper, Sardar Tatar writes his name and number, all of his identifying um, facts, and hands it to Sean Dandridge so Sean Dandridge can call it in, and Sean Dandridge does call it in. So then Sardar asks him, look, should I just cut this guy loose? Um, what should I do? And Sean Dandridge is like, no, you know, until we have intel, you need to be the intel in this case. You need to try to figure out what this guy is planning, you know, who he's planning it, it who he is planning it with, and, um, you know, when it's going to happen, kind of more of the substantive details. Um, and, and so that's exactly what Sardar does, what the police officer told him to. He starts basically being a mole on the informant and starts saying, you know what, I, I'm going to get involved in this. I, you know, at first he's like, I don't want anything to do with this. This is terrible. But then he's like, you know what, I'm in. I'm going to give you a map. What are we going to do? Tell me who all is involved. Are you involved with somebody overseas? You know, how, how are you getting funded? all of these questions and Omar is smart. He knows not to tell him anything substantively about the case, about the plan. So he's like, no, it's just, he never says the name Dukas, the Dukas are nowhere closest. He's like, no, it's just something me and Muhammad are talking about. You give me the map and I'll let you know. You give me the map first. 
So uh, Sardar actually, this is the time, you know, we're talking about 2006. So there's not like these really sophisticated iPhones at that time. They were, ha they had like flip phones and Sardar like programmed his phone somehow. Like if he pushed a button, he would record the conversation. So he's literally trying to be an informant and he says something really like inflammatory and hits record so that he can, you know, show it to the FBI. that This guy's really a terrorist. And, um, and you know, it just doesn't happen. Weeks go by and the FBI never, never contacts Sardar or Dandridge and they're completely confused as to why nothing has happened. Omar ends up purchasing this vehicle for Sardar and then Omar, it's a very quid pro quo. He's like, okay, here's the car. What am I going to get the map? And so Sardar is like, okay, I'll give you the map. I mean, he's already done everything. You know, the map is not anything very, you know, sophisticated. It's something that you could pull off of Google. It's just a pizza delivery map. It's nothing, you know, that extensive. Um, and he's already turned the guy into the FBI. I mean, I don't know what else he's supposed to do. So, um, after Sardar gives the map to the FBI, then the FBI comes and interviews him. And when the FBI interviews him, it's very readily apparent to Sardar that he is the person that's under surveillance, that he is the person that's being, um, uh, that's sort of suspected as being the bad guy. So their tone is very adversarial. He tries to play that clip that he had recorded and he's having technical difficulties. He's told them everything he knows, all the information about Mahmoud Omar. And then at the very end, they said, well, did you give him the map? Like, you know, almost like as a, you know, really cross-examining him, not, not investigating the case as one would if you were trying to investigate as law enforcement. And he's terrified because he's, a, you know, he's not a citizen of this country. He's terrified. So he tells them, um, no, I didn't. I, I didn't give him that. And that was really one of the things that was used against him in the trial. Yeah. Can, can, uh, I, can I break in here now? Mm -hmm. Maybe this is like a novel in which you get, you know, different chapters from different I, points of view. And I, I wanted to cut back to Lamise here and just get her reaction to some stuff. And then we'll come back and get to the Dukas, right? <laughs> okay. So I, I just wanted to ask Lamise, um, after your, your brother was arrested, what was the reaction in the community, and particularly, let's say, in the Muslim community or the community in, in your neighborhood to this? Well, unfortunately, um, the Muslim community right away backed down. Uh, they were afraid. The people that used to talk to us on a daily basis um, come over and act like they were good friends of us um, stopped coming. Uh, there was actually um, a guy that came into Plaza Food Market and um, he knows us. Uh, he was an Egyptian guy and he knows Mahmoud Omar. So after the arrest, he came to us and he said, Mahmoud Omar um, borrowed money from us and uh, fr from me and he needed uh, and I needed money from him. So what happened was Mahmoud came with my brother's pictures, the Duke of his brother's pictures. And he said, hey, pray for me. I'm working on this case. And with this case, if I, if I succeed in it, I'll give you back your money. So um, this guy came to us after the arrest telling us this. And we said, can you witness? Can you say this? He was all in for it. A week later, he's like, I'm sorry, I can't do it. Uh, I, he backed down right away. He couldn't. I don't know if he was threatened or something. But he d he didn't witness with us. He he, he declined it. And there there's a huge element of fear, I think, in the Muslim community at that time. There was a lot of fear. Um, so basically, no, no. Like the people that were willing to stand by us eventually backed down. Like even friends of Mahmoud Omar that knew him, we we approached them. We said, "Hey, you guys know this guy? He was this, 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 that," and they know everything about him. And um, at, they would be, they would be willing to stand with us. And then suddenly, they just, you know what I mean, backed down right away. They were afraid, like something was stopping them, as if they were threatened, or they like no one was willing to step in and actually take the stand to witness with us what was going on. Who did end up supporting you? Did you have some supporters? Who did you? We did. Who did you turn to for support? Um, we, we turned to the, uh, there was the Project Salam, 
they supported yeah. us and which I think is you. Yeah, and, that's, that's my um, group. <laughs> yeah, that's your group. That's what I was going to say. It's your group. That's the people that you guys have been supporting us. Um, but honestly, the mosque organization, no, they did not support us for anything. I mean, all the meetings, webinars, anything in DC, um, any protests, any that was all people that we were just meeting. It wasn't people that we knew before. Did you go to any of the uh, CCF uh, family conferences? Yeah. I, think I know your family was quite involved. Yeah, yeah I, I used to go before um, I moved to Dubai. Um, and I actually was there last year when I was visiting, but um, that's basically, yeah. Well, did, you, did you find those were helpful in any way to, yes. to meet other people that were in the same situation? Of course, because honestly, we thought it was just us. Um, but when we went to the conferences, um, we found out we weren't the only people. Unfortunately, there's so many other people like us. Some have it worse, some have it easier, but we're all in this together. I mean, even if it's just sentencing from five years, 10 years, 20 years life, they've all been um, oppressed, wrongly convicted. They were all targeted for being, you know what I mean? Um, good people to their community. My brother, the Duca brothers were all good to their community. They had, no one ever said anything bad about them. They were helpful, they were there. So basically these people were targeted for doing good for the com community while those informants, their former criminals were actually still criminals. But we, you know what I mean? It's so sad to see that they, uh, the government pays for these. They reward them for getting, uh, going after the good guys. And instead of, you know, any bad guy, any criminal, anyone with no um, integrity, if you tell them, hey, it's either prison for what you've done or go after this guy and manipulate him into saying things that he would never say if it were like another person, if we're normal people, normal friends. Manipulate this person into saying this or go after him, go for his weak spots. And these people are well trained, you know, where my brother wasn't trained to know these kind of people. You know, he's a normal 21 year old living um, with his family, going to school, uh, working in a plaza food market. He's not gonna know that, well, this guy is well paid for to, to, to put me in prison for life, you know? So they pay this criminal to go after the good guys and it just doesn't make sense. And looking at this case, anyone who read the case, anyone who read the full description of the case would know, would laugh at this case because it's really no case when you, when you know the laws and as Huma said, what, what's said between the informant and my brother, that doesn't count as a conspiracy because basically they were um, convicted in conspiracy because the Duca brothers and my brother, and there was not, no such thing as the Duca brothers and my brother talking about attacking the base. So basically, um, what really blew up this case wasn't the evidence. It wasn't what they had. It was the media. Because I'm telling you guys, the second day the media was already saying, oh, these men are facing life. Do we even know anything about the case to say that they're already facing life? I mean, they just put that shooting um, range video from Poconos on the TV and then said, hey, five men are planning to attack a Fort Dix base. So of course, anyone who's watching the media without reading the full story just knows what the media is feeding them. And you know, we all know who media is controlled by. It's what they want us to know. They want us, they want us to, uh, they want to feed us. So basically my brother's case, if anyone has read it and anyone has like gone into details, they would know that there's no case. You know. I just want to quickly ask you one other question, then we're going to get back and find out what happened to the Dukas. Um, the, uh, you have, you go and, well, first of all, where is your brother right now, Mohammed? Mohammed is in Indiana, Terry Hood. Yeah, Terry Hood, right? And so how difficult is it for you, to just describe a little bit about how you go about visiting him and what that entails. That's really, really difficult. Um, and then what, why is he, he's in a, something called a communication management unit? Um, I believe so, yes. Yes, okay, that's that special Muslim prison in Indiana, Terre Haute? Of course. <laughs> yes, okay, go ahead. Just, just explain how, how difficult is this to go there? Well, um, let's begin by how far it is. It's really far from us. Um, we have to go there by plane. So financially, you can imagine how hard it is for us to go there if we would want to go as a whole family. And of course, we, 
no more than five people can be in the visit. So um, if it's my mom, dad, and my sisters, you're talking about airline tickets, um, car rental, in a hotel. Um, of course, there's going to be um, the breakfast, lunch, and dinner is going to be from out too. So it's really, really costly for us as a family to go visit my brother. Like my mom and dad, of course, would wish to see their son every day, but it's hard. They can only see him once a year. Um, and do they see him behind a plate grass on a telephone? I mean, do you, you, do you yeah, get to touch him? That, that used to be for the first 11, 12 years. And then just newly, like a, I can say a year and a year and a half, it's been, we've been able to actually, you know, sit across from him, hug him before we sit down together. But while we're sitting together, we're not allowed to touch, only talking. And then we can take pictures. There's a time where there's pictures. And also, um, towards the end of the visit, we're allowed to go and hug him. But during the visit, like while, while we're talking, you know, we're not allowed to touch because right away they'll seem that we're slipping him something, you know, you never know. So basically that's it. Right. Okay, Huma, uh, you, you want to tell us what happened with the Dukas? I want to tell you a lot about a lot of things. <laughs> I'm actually looking at my notes and I'm gonna cut a big chunk out and just move straight into the Dukas. But right. as, as of right now, uh, they've got, Omar has not had an agreement with anybody set together yet. So that's just what I wanna keep you, you know, I want just to keep you a running ticker of what conspiracy is and what's required. So let's talk about the Dukas because they are a huge piece of this puzzle. Um, so just by way of background, again, these, they're, they're three brothers. They're ethnically Albanian. They live in Cherry Hill. They're really invested in the Muslim community. They spend a lot of time in the masjid and um, they know everybody. They're, they're ready to take their shirts off their backs to help anybody in the community. And they're known for that. They're known for that. They um, also were not really religiously inclined until... Um, somewhat recent, like before the investigation started, just a few years before the investigation started. So they have like, you know, a lot of sort of zealousness around their religious identity and helping other people who um, are kind of learning their religious identity. None of these guys went to high school. They own and operate their own roofing company. They grew up in Brooklyn and have a very forget about it kind of a vibe to them. Um, they're really welcoming, um, loving, loyal, and inviting. And they're also kind of an open book. Whatever they think and feel, you're going to get it without a filter. You're going to know about what they think. And they're not going to use like nice and refined language about like the military industrial complex and systemic racism, even though that's what they're talking about, because, you know, they don't they don't talk think tank. They talk their lived experience as blue collar workers who are making ends meet and working hard to support their families. So the Dukas develop a relationship around their fa uh, with Omar, um, basically this facilitated through uh, Muhammad. And um, a lot of their relationship is a business relationship. It's also a friendship, but it starts out with Omar purchasing these three vehicles that I mentioned from an auto auction. And then they start hanging out, fixing those together. And basically Omar spends a significant amount of time with these guys, but he can't get them to say anything that even remotely comes to any kind of criminal conspiracy or terrorism. And Omar tells the FBI that. It's actually in a 302. He tells the FBI that these guys are just interested in making money, nothing else. Not only does the FBI not listen to what their own informant, who is a con artist and has made $250,000 from working with the FBI, um, not only do they not listen to him, they actually hire another informant to work the case simultaneously that is specifically for the Dukas. And this informant's name is Besnik Bakali. He's an ethnic Albanian. And what did Besnik have to do to cooperate with the FBI? He, my friends, attempted to commit murder in Albania and then he fled from Albania into the United States illegally and was sitting in an immigration detention center ready to be deported back to Albania where he would face a blood feud and would likely be killed um, because it's, you know, life for life over there in some parts. Um, and, uh, and he decided, 
ah, I'd rather live and cooperate with the United States government as an informant. So for him, his life literally depended on it. And like every informant, the FBI has created an entire story for him to use. And his story is that he was, as an ethnic Albanian, he lived in Kosovo during the genocide of the Albanians. And he took it upon himself to take up arms and join the Kosovo Liberation Army. And he was engaged in guerrilla warfare warfare because that's what he believed was the right thing to do and the chivalrous thing to do for his people. And Besnik also has this whole story that he has no family, he's depressed, he's suicidal, he's trying to, you know, uh, find some hope in religion. And of course, what do the, what do, the Dukas do? They, they bring him into the fold. They bring him in like family. He's at the Duca's house. He's eating dinner with them. He's invited to Eid festivals with them. I mean, they are reaching out and trying to heal this person who they see as a trauma survivor. Um, little do, do they know that this trauma survivor is actually trying to ensnare the Duca. So best, whenever they begin to talk about politics, and politics is a very normal thing for them to discuss, um, Besnik starts saying, y'all, are you guys even men? Why aren't y'all picking up arms? Y'all keep talking. Why aren't you doing anything? Look at me. I fought in the army, in the KLA, and I protected my people. Y'all are just sitting here, you know, going to Dunkin' Donuts and, um, and, play, and playing at arcades. What kind of men are you? And over and over again, you see that the Dukas are constantly trying to calm him down and say, look, you know, there's a time for everything. You are, have basically just converted to Islam, more or less, and you need to learn the basics of the religion and, and not be, get so easily flustered and frustrated and just try to be a good person right now. Learn to pray before you try to kill people, learn to pray. You know, that's kind of what they're saying. And um, in the course of this time, there's only one time in this sting where Dritan Duca actually does get very inflamed and irritated and says, you know what, let's do something. Um, and very shortly after that, he reneges from what he said and he was like, you know what, I was very upset. And um, this is not, the, the re real jihad is to take care of your family and to raise them in this religion, in this culture. So Besnik really wasn't able to, to do a whole lot, but Mahmoud Omar, who is our businessman, comes to Dritan Duka and he says, look, they, they, have, um, they went on vacation again. They tried to make this Poconos trip an annual thing. And there's about 15 to 20 guys sharing four guns at a gun range. And he notices that that's a huge shortage. Um, lots of people are standing around in February in the Poconos in freezing cold weather trying to uh, share a gun and it's not fun. So Omar, ever the con artist, sees his opportunity and says, look, um, are do y'all need guns? And the Dukas are in the process of getting their documentation in the United States. They came here through the Mexico-Texas border um, when they were two, four, and six years old. And so they were undocumented at the time, which meant that they weren't able to purchase guns on the open market like a normal person would be able to, although that is certainly what they wanted and they were moving towards getting documented. So oh, Omar approaches Rita and Rita's like, yeah, uh, I'll take two guns. Well, Omar shows up with, and he gives him a price, like kind of what he's expecting. Omar shows up with a list that is like basement bargain prices, one third the cost of wholesale, a deal where you couldn't get anywhere because it was fabricated by the FBI. And the reason why the FBI made such low prices is because they wanted the Dukas to buy more so that they could create this, um, you know, story or facade that they were trying to stockpile weapons. On the list, there were all kinds of other things like RPGs and M60s that really were military grade. And Dritan um, approached Omar and said, look, who is your, who is this business person that you know? Because these are some real serious weapons and I have five kids. I have five kids and if they find me with something like this, they're going to take me down and all I want is to go shoot at the Poconos. They're going to call me a terrorist. So who is your dealer? And Omar is like, no, no, no. You know me. I know everybody. This guy's legit. So what happens is... Uh, 
both Dritan and Shane go to Omar's apartment and he, excuse me, he has the weapons, basically guns that they were planning on using at the Poconos. And the moment that they purchased these weapons, which they believe were legitimate, um, is the moment that the, that the FBI kind of storms into the apartment. The FBI arrests Mohammed um, at the airport at the same time where he's driving a taxi. They arrest Sardar outside his, his apartment, who he just come back from dinner with his, um, with his pregnant wife. And ultimately, in all of this, there was never a single moment where all five of these men looked at this map together. The Dukas didn't even know a map existed. Um, Muhammad never bought any weapons, neither did Sardar. The Dukas had never heard the words Fort Dix in context in this context. So there was never an agreement. What there was was Omar and Muhammad, Omar and um, Sardar, Omar and these brothers. What you see is the constant thread is Omar. And without Omar, there is no case because there was no case because there was no criminal conspiracy to begin with. Wow. That's a brilliant summary of the case. I got to say, I learned a lot from you. Thank you. You're very uh, welcome. I just, I'm, we're almost out of time here, and, but I just wanted to ask a couple of quick uh, follow-up questions. Um, I, uh, Lamise, you have, uh, w one of the problems I assume in these cases is trying to afford lawyers. How uh -huh. difficult has this been? Well, it's been very difficult because um, we, uh, we signed up with LaunchGood to hire a, um, an attorney to help us with the case since there were very um, wrong doings in my brother's case during the trial. So this, guy, this lawyer is really good for you know, catching on these errors and fixing them so we can open, reopen the case. So we approached- you have, uh, Just let me just interrupt you here. Do you have a present uh, attempt to get money now for lawyers or not? Yeah, now oh. we do. We, Could you talk about that? Yeah. I'm going to speak about launch good and then I'm going to go on and say what our current, um, All right. what we're doing currently. We signed up with launch good and uh, because it was a Muslim platform after we prepared the fundraiser and we were good to go live for the donations. Um, we collected around over $18,000. Our goal was $20,000 at the time. So we told, there were many donors that were that were generous enough to donate for my brother's cause. However, when we came to receive the money, Blue Snap, which is their credit processor, denied the payment, saying that this is a criminal um, case and they're not able to wow. to process the payment for us. Right. So um, that was that was Launch Goods res like uh, respond to us saying that this is what Blue, Blue Snap was telling us. So we hired the attorney to go after Blue Snap, and our uh, our attorney asked um, Blue Snap for their terms, and in return, Launch Good returned um, the money to the donors without even a heads up, without giving us a chance to explain what's going to go on, to tell the donors, "Well, guys, you guys are going to be getting your money credited back into your accounts." nothing we weren't giving the opportunity suddenly everyone was asking questions hey we donated money but it's credit back to our account is there any reason why so now that we uh made it clear to the donors what's going on i sent a couple emails to the people that actually um were able to leave their emails uh during the donation process i emailed them and uh we had a couple people share about what went on so they can go ahead and donate to um our accounts, Venmo, um, Zelly, and PayPal. So right now we're receiving donations through that. All right, good. And so you have some legal, you're still pursuing some legal remedies here? Yes. Good. I, I know this is a while after the convictions, and so this is these are probably what we would call post-conviction remedies, and those are always more difficult to do, but they are nonetheless important, and uh, you. What what is particularly important, I think, is that the mood of the country is changing. The hysteria is dying down, 
are now more, I think, uh, afraid of the, the virus than we are of the terrorists. And maybe also the FBI, I might add. We might be more afraid of the FBI. Certainly the Republicans seem to be more afraid of the FBI. So uh, this may be a time where it's possible to review the, these cases. It is. Um, I, mean, yeah. I, I, I mean, I really hope that my, like, my brother's cases reopen, as well as like the Duca brothers and the people that we actually meet in these conferences that are like my brother and like my families that wish for their sons to be out of jail because they are innocent. They are like, I, I urge anyone who's watching this um, webinar to please go and read about the case and share awareness. At this moment, we are really trying to reopen my brother's case and as well as everyone else's. You know, everyone want, has a dream to, to have these people released. So I urge everyone to read about the case and share awarenesses and reach out to the families because support and if, as a community, we stick together and we stand together, we will have a voice. But as uh, you were asking me, Steve, before, if we got any support. Now, I believe that if we really, as a, commu as a Muslim community, if we all stood together and didn't, didn't stay silent as we were told to, I think we would have had our voice heard. Um, we've, we had protests posted outside the courtrooms during um, the trial, during the sentences, I believe that there, it would have been another way. But if you're gonna target Muslims and everyone is gonna stay silent about it, you're just gonna keep on going and going and going. So I believe that awareness and for us to educate ourselves about these case, about our rights as, uh, as citizens, we won't be that afraid to stand up for our rights. But because we're clueless about our rights and we don't read the laws um, and we don't want to help out, we just want to stay, you know, stay in the shade. We, w we don't want to get out of our comfort zone. We're going to stay, um, we're going to stay afraid and they're going to stay after us. We're not going to be the first or last case. As we see in the conferences, there's more people every conference. There's new cases every conference. And it's sad. And it's time for us to stand up for our rights because this is not right. This is not right for my brother to be arrested at the age of 22 and he's turning 35. You know, it's not right at all. He's been in there for 13 years. Why is he in there for life when there's criminals, killers out there going on, you know, on bail, um, getting five years and getting out? How is that fair? You know, it's not fair. So it's logically speaking, if we look at all the cases and if we you know, educate ourselves, we would notice that there's something wrong going on. Not just me, not just you, not just Tuma. Everyone will get up and stand together and have our voices united. So I urge anyone who's looking at this or, or heard about this webinar to go on and look at the cases, read about my brother's case, look at something that he did that, you know what I mean? Look, at, look for something that he did that he deserved a life sentence. That's, that's really beautiful, Lamis. I'm so glad you said it, and you said it with so much passion. Um, I, we're, we're out of time, but I just wanted to give you all both one last chance to say something. But for that, I just want to mention that for a lot of people, and unfortunately, the, 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 uh, the Fort Dix Five may be included in those people, uh, there are, they are running out of legal options because of the way the law is structured, and the law is simply unfair. So CCF is attempting to pass a law, which if passed, would allow a lot of these cases to be brought back into court and reviewed under a new standard. It's called the uh, Entrapment and Governmental Overreach Relief Act, also known as the Ego Relief Act. And uh, that it, it has three components to it. With respect to the material support for terrorism laws, uh, they right now do not require intent to engage in terrorism. So you can be convicted of material support for terrorism without ever intending it. So one of the things we want to do is make sure that nobody gets convicted or remains in jail if they did not intend to support terrorism. Uh, another one has to do with entrapment. Uh, we want to codify for the first time an entrapment defense and to uh, ensure in this codification 
that the FBI cannot start a sting operation to try to entrap somebody into a crime unless the person has already taken substantial steps to engage in that very crime. That will prevent them from being able to set up people who they, for some reason, ideologically or to increase their budget, they can just go after and target because they're perceived to be weak or maybe there's a mental issue or maybe for any other reason. They have to actually have a criminal reason to go after the person. And the final thing, part of the ego bill, is to say that the government should not be allowed to give classified information to the trial judge uh, without showing it to defense counsel because this has been a persistent problem in all of these cases where the FBI we believe classifies uh, lies about the defendant and then shows it to the trial judge as classified evidence to poison the mind of the trial judge. So the ego bill, we're trying to get it passed. We really want the Muslim community to support it. We want everybody that you know of to support it. And the way you can do that is to contact your representative, your senators, your, your house representatives, and you should be doing that in any event. This is what the modern view of things is. If you don't tell them, they don't know. And therefore, they will not do anything to represent you in a positive way. The only way you can guarantee that they will represent you and represent your interests and represent the things that you care about is if you contact them. And when you do it, tell them about the Ego Relief Act. And it's up. you can find more information about it on our website. So with that little pitch for our, our bill, which we hope we can get some of these folks out, uh, do you have anything else that you'd like to say? And I'll just give each of you just a, a brief time, just uh, if you want to say anything else. Uh, I'll start with you, Huma. Do you have anything, uh, last thoughts? Yeah, so um, just two things. Um, one is that I just want you guys to think for a moment that these four out of these five men are going to spend the rest of their lives in prison under the, their current um, sentence. Uh, God, God willing, that won't be the case. Um, you know, there will be something that will come out in, in terms of post-conviction relief motion, but um, this is for conspiracy. They, they didn't even hurt anybody, and the conspiracy uh, evidence, as I've shown you, is, is, is false. So life in prison for something like that, um, it's just, it's abominable. But uh, also, I just wanted to say one more thing, which is just, I want to give my, my heartfelt thanks to um, CCF and, and Project Salam. Um, I wouldn't know about Fort Dix 5 if it wasn't for Project Salam. That's how I got involved in this case. And when I got involved in this case, um, I, I was like, everybody needs to know about this. <laughs> I have to write a book. I've never written a book before, but everybody needs to know about this. But I, I just want to tell everybody that you, if you're not already supporting CCF, you should be. This is an organization that um, you know, really runs on a shoestring budget and people donate a lot of their time and effort and good faith and they're speaking for uh, communities to, to retain their freedom. So thank you for that. And thank you for having me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. You were beautiful. That was just a wonderful presentation. Uh, Lamise, you have any fi final thoughts? Um, yes, I do actually. Good. Um, now we're speaking about the um, lawyers and about the about how hard it is for uh, Muslims to collect funds to fight for the rights for the like as us as anyone who wants to fight for justice for their their own in jail. Um, you know what? Something that actually um, sparked up is that when we intended on collecting donation through lunch good and with blue snap saying that this is a criminal case what confuses me is that george floyd, uh, the the police officer that killed george floyd and it was on social media and it built so many awareness because it was actually videoed and out to the public but that cop they um were able to um collect a million dollars in, to bail him out and he was bailed out and he killed an innocent man okay so we're talking about these innocent men that never did anything um never owned a weapon never my brother was all talk and he was to the informant he didn't he didn't even have the guts to you know go to the duca brothers and go with this on with this crazy plan because he knew that he would be you know they'll think that he went crazy he, he was scared to go to them. 
And yeah, he's serving life in prison for conspiracy, for something he didn't intend to do, for something he never did. He never committed a crime. And I like I want to close on that thought is just think about these men that are saving life when you know they never did anything. They're innocent. They never committed a crime. And also, um, if you're already not following Project Salam and CCF, please go ahead and do because you will learn about our case, about so many other cases as well. And therefore, you guys will really have the time to educate yourselves with all the cases that have been that have been wronged, men that have been wronged, men that are serving right now prison time for something they didn't do. And also, it's a wake up call for us as well, for anyone, that there are informants out there. We are still targets. We are still targets. So even if people don't have like the funds to donate or anything, you know, spread awareness because we, we are still targets, as I mentioned, and it's important to stay, to stay um, open-minded. And because if we had that awareness, if my brother knew about what's going on, that we are targets. My brother would have knew that there was something off about Mahmoud Omar, about Joseph, the Duca's brothers would have knew about the sneak, but they would have had, they would have said, you know, this guy is coming off weird, all aggressive and talking about um, attacking the US. So I think it's really important to spread awareness and to spread it to our family and friends. And um, thank you so much, Steve, for having us and Huma for your time uh, to talk about this case, to actually write a book about this, and for CCF for supporting us and hosting this webinar. Well, thank you both for coming on, you two beautiful people, and I hope you all the best. Uh, and I, it, you really touched me, honestly. Um, I think about the case all the time, but you've given me things that I just, I didn't even know about this case. It's, it's even worse, and uh, Huma, you're, I hope, I wanna read your book. So, thank you all very much. Um, Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. We can sign off.